Welcome back to Bookview TV. Now this week we're talking with James Wharton. He's the author of Out in the Army, My Life as a Gay Soldier. It was released two weeks ago here in the UK. Now James, we spent much of the first segment talking about some of your activism on behalf of soldiers and how it is that, that you're doing this ongoing today for the LGBT community since you left the Army in April. I'd like though now to go back to the beginning. Now, you grew up in Wrexham here in Wales, confused about your sexuality and living in school under an arcane rule called Section 28. Now, for the benefit of those who live outside of Britain and watch this program, what the heck is Section 28? Well, you know, for me, I didn't know what it was going through it, but what I certainly knew was when I wanted to ask a teacher about sexuality, and it was just after we'd done the usual boring sex education, which in the, in the late 90s was just dull, as you can imagine. And um, I just said to the teacher at the end of the lesson, oh, that's all well and good, but how do two men have sex? Just genuinely asking, you know, not even, not mischievously, it was private, it was after the lesson. And she just turned around and said, well, I, I, I don't even know where to begin with this answer. All I can say to you is you need to go and speak to the school nurse about it. And that was when I thought to myself, oh, sexuality must be a medical condition, you know. As an 11-year-old, 12-year-old boy, when you are, you are told to go and speak to a, someone in the healthcare profession about sexuality, you then just suddenly assume that it's a health matter. Uh, and that was one of the, um, the unfortunate outcomes of, of Section 28, which effectively banned the promotion or the, um, the, the talking of, I guess, within a school environment of homosexuality and gay relationships. And it was my introduction to Section 28, a personal introduction to it. So, at some point in time in your life, you begin to figure out that you are indeed gay. You live in conservative and quiet North Wales, and then after enlisting, you're off to London at age 16 or 17 for the first time after basic training, and your life starts to take some pretty wild turns. Tell us a bit about your first experience in that London gay scene. Well, my very first experience, I was 18 years of age, and it was about a week after I told my friends that I was gay in the army. And one of, our, one of my three friends is a little bit older than the rest of us. He was 25, and he was actually from London, so he knew a lot about um, the city and where, where people hang out and things like that. And he just said, you know, James, there's a place called Soho down the road. I think you should go and spend some time there. You might make some friends. And, I, and that's exactly what I did. But um, I went into the first gay bar I went into was called the Duke of Wellington and I was a very nervous, you know, fresh out the closet 18 year old who was probably terrified or who certainly looked terrified and uh, it, it was interesting, it was just, it was a very scary moment but I remember thinking it was one of those brilliant moments where I just felt completely liberated and, uh, and yeah, you know, loads of men were checking me out and staring at me and I felt very much under the microscope and it was scary but I I enjoyed it at the same time, you know. I would imagine in some respects this would be like taking a kid out of uh, Kansas, a Kansas small town and dropping, you know, his 18-year-old uh, being in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip across the street from the Mustang Ranch. Uh, talk about the lessons you learned, though, particularly from all the hooking up, and then you had an experience with an STD. And this again goes back to Section 28, I think. It links in very, very well. I, I got completely caught up in the Soho scene as a fresh out of the closet 18 year old. There was no stop sign for me to take notice of. And I certainly and I certainly didn't sort of hold back. And once I got introduced to the scene, I, I returned to the scene again and again and again. And it was becoming a daily thing. I made friends and I was out with them every night till very, very late in the morning. And after a little while it just became normal for me to head home with a stranger every night and that went on for quite some time but interestingly at the same time I was in work every morning at six o'clock with a terrible hangover always but I was always in work and then I would be you know three hours later riding on a horse behind behind the Queen on an escort or something so there's this incredible um, difference between my nightlife and the lifestyle I was getting involved in in that respect and this very traditional day life with the royal family and uh, and escorting the sovereign on state occasions and uh, and yeah it did all come to a head like you said when I I got unwell with an ST 
uh, I and it was it was the wake up call I really needed, and it was also the time when my very good friend, who I speak about in the book, Faulkner, ever turned around to me and spoke to me like he was my father, and just said, "You need to sort your life out because otherwise it's gonna it's gonna end soon." And uh, and that was the wake up call. Not so long after, my now husband Tom entered my life, and he and he certainly did enter at that right time. Now you you, you talk about uh, you know being in the horse guards. And um, I often tell U.S. visitors to London, skip the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. The real show is the Horse Guards Parade on Whitehall. Now, what's it like to be 18 years old and, and part of such a prestigious posting? It's incredibly strange. Looking back now, I just think it's a time of my life which all seems hazy. And the reason why it seems hazy and, and a bit dreamlike is because I was going through this night thing every night where I was going out and getting drunk so that the day bit seems to just sort of disappear into um, into a haze in my mind but it's odd you know you sit there for an hour and millions and millions and millions of people take pictures of you and it's really really strange and um, but it's, it's an ancient tradition that dates back to 1660 and you just understand that for that hour when you're responsible for that guard on your horse you're fitting into this incredible tapestry of history that began 360 years ago and just for that hour, that's where you fit into that entire um, legacy. And it will go on again for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know? Well, after that came the posting, everyone in your family, and probably to some extent you dreaded, you were headed off to Iraq. And this was such a brutal time on so many levels. I mean, it seemed though that in combat, as rockets rained down on the camp or lives were in danger, there were so many acts of selflessness and heroism on the part of everyone, and your sexuality never mattered at any point. Talk a bit about the guy, for example, who threw himself on top of your own body when your helmet and protective kit were not within reach. Yeah, that was a moment that will always stay with me. I mean, we were having our dinner, our evening meal in the base, and the, the Iraqis downtown who would send the rockets to us, knew that at six o'clock every night we'd all be sat in a massive tent having our dinner and they knew at six o'clock in the morning we'd all be getting up and having a shave or a shower. So these vulnerable times they they knew about so that's when they would send their rockets over and on this one occasion that we were in the dinner for the dining facility which was a huge tent and um, yeah some, some rockets started to come in and instead of making my way to the far end of that canvas tent to find my helmet and body armor and, you know, potentially putting myself in danger by doing so. The soldier, a senior soldier to me, who was sat next to me, who was a, who was a sergeant, just sort of said, no, just lie down and I'll lie on top of you because he had his helmet and his body armor. And, and I spoke about it in my book because it's something in my mind that really stands out for the whole period of, t of my time in Iraq. Well, you know, there was another bit of selflessness as well. In Iraq and then later in Canada, you got to know Prince Harry very, very well. And there was a fairly serious incident where you were under some significant threat and the prince himself came to your defense. Talk a little bit about that. I put it in my book and I'm, I'm always keen to point out that if the person in question had been anybody else, I'd have still put it in my book because what essentially happened was a junior officer within the army um, and sometimes officers are portrayed in the media or people's idea of an officer a British officer in the military is quite different to what they actually are I think in 2013 and um, and as you said I got into a situation where I was potentially heading for a bit of trouble well I certainly felt like I was in danger put it that way and I needed to speak to my boss the officer who just so happened to be Prince Harry and he took on the situation and he absorbed all the information about the situation, which was quite colourful. And I'm sure you know, um, Dennis, from reading the book, the situation was quite, you know, colourful indeed. Um, he absorbed all that information and he went away and dealt with the problem. And he dealt with it really um, incredibly and significantly as well. So I, I wanted to recall that in the book. It just so happens to be that it's Prince Harry. Now, it's obviously of a lot of interest to a lot of people, and it's what the press in particular have, um, have, have zoned in on on the book. But it was a moment for me where a junior officer dealt with something that was incredibly modern and 21st century like. And, 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 and I, won't, I won't spoil it at all for, for the potential reader of the book, but it is definitely worth going into. Um, now, like many a soldier, you looked forward 
to that moment we were able to go home for a few weeks and in this case it was to be with the then love of your life Tom only while there you suffered what many returning warriors do a very painful breakup what was so surprising to me was how you spoke so openly about that pain and, and I'm so used in literature to reading about lost heterosexual love the pain of this came across so poignantly and beautiful what was happening and how hard was that to write about well it was incredibly difficult to write about more so because and i hope i'm not spoiling the story uh, but tom and i are today in civil partnership and we, we're very happy and we live together in in windsor so you know as i was writing about this terribly traumatic experience from five years ago six years ago now i um i did have to consider that um that this person is in my life today Having said that, I didn't want to then go in half-heartedly with how I honestly felt back then. So I had the very realist, realistic thought that Tom will read the book and he will be probably sat next to me when he reads the book. Um, but I also wanted, I thought I owed it to the story to be incredibly honest about just how exactly I felt back then. Now, of course, when I was in Iraq, for the first time in my life, and I've never done it since, I kept a diary. Um, and I was able to go back into that diary and see exactly how I felt, the raw emotions and, and the realism of, of having to come to terms with this person, hugely important person in my life, um, leaving me. So, yeah, an interesting part of the book to write. Well, it really is fabulous. And when we return with part three of our interview with James Warden, he's the author of Out in the Army, My Life as a Gay Soldier, we'll discuss how a photo shoot and page three article for Soldier magazine changed his life forever. All that when BookView TV continues. Stay right here.